on behalf of Space Education and the Search Foundation, and on my personal behalf, I warmly welcome Dr. Tesh Kumar Mishra, uh, who is the speaker for this webinar, and all the participants from different countries who are taking part in this webinar. Uh, I, in fact, today is the second talk uh, by uh, Dr. Ritesh uh, Kumar Mishra, and it is entitled as Big Bang and Chronology of the Solar System. So <clears throat> before uh, I introduce him yesterday uh, uh, to you, uh, so today uh, I will be a little brief in introducing him to you. And uh, let me also make an announcement that the, the talk which he gave yesterday, a very good talk, has already been uploaded uh, along with PPT on, uh, on the internet. And the link for that is available on Space Education and Research Foundation's website. So you all are welcome uh, to use them at your convenience. <clears throat> So, uh, Dr. Tesh Kumar Mishra had an excellent academic uh, career and uh, did his PhD from Physical Research Laboratory at Ahmedabad, which is a unit of uh, Department of Space Government of India. And uh, after that, he had done post very good postdoctoral work at um, excellent centers uh, around the globe. Uh, to name few uh, are like uh, uh, in France, uh, in, in USA, uh, and also in Germany. And he, uh, beside having a good uh, scientific interest in various topics of uh, space science and uh, astronomy, uh, he also uh, has interest in uh, reading, writing, and participating in uh, various debates and discussions. With these few words, now I request Dr. Tesh Kumar uh, Mishra to start his talk. And I, along with all of you, will uh, continue uh, to listen to him. Dr. Ritesh Kumar Mishra, please. <clears throat> Thank you, Professor Vats. Um, welcome to this second talk of the series. Um, so the first two and half talks, so this session and the half of the next uh, talk, the first one and these these two are more of a general nature, trying to build up uh, the base on which uh, we will talk the, uh, the difficult or the, uh, the more integrated stuff in the, in the following lectures. So these two talks are meant to build up uh, the, the basic premise so that all of us are on the same page and uh, so that we can handle the critical question that we want to answer. Since it's an interdisciplinary field uh, involving several areas of astronomy, planetary sciences, uh, a lot of mineralogy and all that, slowly, slowly we, we are attempting to build that up. And the second lecture is going to be in that particular series, uh, which is entitled Big Bang and Chronology of the Solar System. So what we intend to do today is to uh, pick up from where we left in the la from the last last talk. In the last talk, what we tried to do do was to, was to find a motivation as to uh, find a reason as to why we exist on this earth and whether there is a possibility of life on other planets around the other stars. So what are the uh, what are our current state of understanding or what are the current state of observations that we currently have? which is motivating us to understand our existence on this particular earth. So, so with that, let's start the, let's talk, let's talk about, uh, let's talk about Big Bang and cosmology. So yesterday I said uh, uh, that our solar system, uh, a sun, which is a G2V type of a star, is about 4.56 billion years old. But the sun itself, uh, the, while the sun itself is just 4.56 billion years old, the galaxy Milky Way in, it, in which it resides 
have got stars in its in its bulge in the central portion and it which is called as bulge is about 3.6 billion years old which means our galaxy itself is about 3.6 billion years old so let's first get down to how do we get into galaxy how matter is created how it gets into the star uh, to make up the galaxy before we answer that specific question as to how solar system forms so to answer that question we have to go to the start of the universe which is called as big bang it was a uh, derogatory or uh, in a jokingly way said by fred hole as as big bang or start of a very uh, of a big thing in a with a, with a bang but it has that name has stuck so about 3.7 or 3.6 billion years ago our universe starts uh, with from a singularity uh, about which we currently do not know fully the, because the laws of physics gravitation and uh, quantum field theory do not apply at that particular scale because of such a high density of matter radiation uh, and energy at that particular point of time so what so we do not know exactly as to what happens at the very beginning but we but we can make some predictions from a time little later than that so that time is called planck scale which is 10 to the power minus 47 seconds so beyond at 10 to the power minus 46 seconds and beyond the the current understanding of quantum field theory as well as gravitation relativistic gra gravitation gravitation theory that we currently know is not applicable and therefore we cannot answer or we cannot make we cannot make a prediction or study what was happening before that so we start with a we start with a with a planck's time and then as as within a few minutes a lot of things happen as the, the inflation takes place the, the universe expands as such then slowly slowly it starts to cool as the as the matter starts to as the as the uh, the universe starts to expand and then slowly slowly one after the other as the energy goes down the the because of the expansion as well as uh, as well as cooling subsequently matter 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 is created which gets down into to to form the first nuclei then first atoms and then these atoms get together to form first stars and then those stars form the galactic structure to form the galaxy that we currently see so we are here about we are here 3.7 billion years ago but as we continue to go back all these events have happened at 3. Point, about 3.7 billion years ago so how do we know that this happened all of this happened 3.7 billion years ago the, the the age of the solar system was was inferred from a uh, exemplary work by edwin hubble edwin hubble using the the hooker telescope at mount wilson so that was one of the largest telescope about 2.5 meters in diameter largest telescope from 1970 when it was made to till 1947 using this telescope uh, the 100 inch telescope edwin hubble could edwin hubble could show that the galaxies around us the galaxies around us are are moving away from us depending upon how far they are from us so if we plot the velocity with which the galaxy is moving away from us with respect to the distance that they are they are from the, from our galaxy then we get a relationship like this which is called hubble's law where the velocity is directly proportional to the distance from our own galaxy so now if we interpolate it back to the time t equals to 0 then distance r by v would give us the time which would be inverse value of h0 which is called hubble's constant from current from the best current measurements we have this value is equal to 69.8 plus minus 1.9 kilometers per second per mega parsec so if i invert this value one parsec is equal to 3.1 times 10 to power 13 it's a mega parsec so multiplied by 10 to power 6 we make an inversion of it we get a value 3.6 times 10 to the power minus 9 years so that's how we know that our solar system start or up our universe started with started 13.6 billion years ago 
This is the data that uh, Hubble published in 1929, the one shown in the smaller panel, uh, which would comprise the region, this, the smallest red region indicated in this larger figure, more updated figure published by Kishner et al. in 2004. Several more recent updated studies has been uh, done and which is giving us this value which I which I said H0 is equal to 69.8 kilometers per second per milliparsec. So that's how we know that our universe is 13.6 billion years old. So now if we now we know our so our universe is 13.7 billion 13.6 billion years old and uh, we can't uh, because of uh, the the uh, the lacuna in the uh, quantum field theory and gravitational uh, relativistic gravitational theory, we can't say anything beyond 10 to the power minus 43 seconds, which is called Planck's time. So as the time progresses, the energy tends to decrease. The inflation, uh, the universe, all of a sudden expands. This is a theoretical construct given by uh, Alan Good who gave this theory of rapid expansion of the universe to, to, to understand, to, to reconcile the homogeneity and the uh, horizon problem. So afterwards, as the energy tends to lower down, symmetry breaking takes place, the universe cools down and slightly some more matter over antimatter is created. So in 10, in, in 10 billion particles, because of this interaction of energy and radiation, they are at, same at that particular point of time. They are being interconverted into each other. Finally, as the as the universe cools down, in every 10 billion particle antiparticle pair, one extra particle is created. We are currently trying to understand how this kind of an asymmetry in generation of particle takes place. Uh, but that is not the uh, but that is not the concern in this particular talk. So one so. 10 billion one particle is created while 10 billion antiparticles are created. So there is extra one particle in every 10 billion particle. So that's how the matter starts to matter starts to increase in number and finally those form the hadrons and then they form the nuclei, then they form the atom and and, and the story goes on. So let's take a look at what, since we don't know very about the very initial time, let's let's look at the real, to the time scale that we know for sure with a greater detail. So at 10 to the power minus six seconds or one microsecond, the energy of photon is still sufficient that two photons can interact together to give a to give a particle and an antiparticle, and then those antiparticle anti antiparticle and particle can can get together to give to give back the gamma ray photons again. So this kind of an interplay, interconversion between energy and matter is taking place simultaneously and that continues to continues to happen for, for a while. So at this point of time, the universe is a flickering soup of all this all this stuff. So but as but as the universe is, is expanding, it is slowly and slowly cooling. At 10 to the power minus four seconds, the energy of photon is only at about 10 to the power 12 Kelvin. At 10 to the power 12 Kelvin, the energy of photon is not high enough to create neutron and proton and particle and antiparticle. And therefore, neutrons and protons and high, therefore the, the whatsoever neutrons and protons are created, they are annihilated back into photon. But at this point of a time, that asymmetry of one extra number is generated, which 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 propagates into the into the matter that we currently see. At a still later time of about four seconds, the energy is high enough that proton and proton cannot be created, but electron and anti-electron can be created. So, so the conversion between electron and anti-electron is taking place, and so all the neutrons, protons, and electrons are created by by the first second, by the by the first four seconds. So the universe continues to expand and cool and by two minutes the energy of photons is still not is, is not high enough so that it can break up the atomic nuclei that has formed by by uh, that can form by the by the strong reaction strong forces between two uh, 
protons, protons or neutrons, or two between two nuclear force between two nuclei, and therefore the first nuclei of deuterium forms at about this time. So once a nuclei nuclei is created, the nuclei would continue to 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 interact with each other, but then there are no stable nuclei at mass five and eight. And therefore, that continuous build up to the next to the next to the level because of this interaction doesn't take place, and the nucleosynthesis stops somewhere at lithium. So, uh, so, so some so so large so some amount of hydrogen, helium, and lithium is created, but nothing more is created during this this process. So at time d equals to 30 minutes, the uh, the temperature has cooled off sufficiently. So we have so the universe is now made up of about 20% of helium nuclei and 75% of hydrogen nuclei. This matches the abundance that we currently see in the oldest stars uh, in our galaxy as well as elsewhere. The oldest stars exist in, in the halo of our in the halo or the bulge of our galaxy, where we see that the abundance of the oldest stars. Are of this satisfy this criteria. At still a later time, about fifty thousand years, less than fifty thousand years, the the universe is still compact enough so that radiation and matter are more or less at the same amount. So radiation is converting into uh, into matter, and because it is so compact, it is it is again interacting with photon to create back to create back radiation. And that is in a dynamical state, being created and being annihilated at the same time. So, so it's a soup of all this kind at that particular time. So, because the energy is high enough, these these nuclei cannot capture electron, uh, and therefore most of the nuclei. So, the gas is ionized at this particular point of time. Around five thousand, around fifty thousand years, the universe starts to become matter dominated, uh, and then. The matter can get together to form, get together to form more and more, uh, uh, more and more. Can the gravity can start to play play its role? So at about a uh, hundred thousand years, the universe has now expanded enough so that now the density of photon and uh, matter is not so high that 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 radiation cannot escape out. Therefore. The nuclei can now capture an electron and form form an form a stable atom. This epoch this epoch is called recombination, and this epoch is what we see in the cos in the CMBR record. So this at this point of a time, because radiation has started to escape out, this the universe this is what is referred to as dark age. So once these atoms have formed, they will, uh, because of statistical uh, processes, one of the regions will have a more slightly more gravitational attraction, and then the first stars will form. Once the stars are formed, they will they will emit out radiations. Some of those radiations, because these the first forming stars are very massive, will be in the form of UV radiations, which will start to ionize the gas around. So for the first time. The universe will become visible because of this light, because of this ionization of the atoms around. This epoch is called reionization event, and this epoch is called as epoch of reionization (EOI). So now the universe will become visible. Uh, no, sorry, the universe has. So the first stars are. The, this is the way the first stars are born, or the first stars that we see are of this kind. This is a summary slide which shows all that we briefly summarize. We start from a uh, our understanding starts from a Planck era. There's a quark blue on soup, and then they form hadrons, and then they form nuclei, and then they form atoms, and then these atoms get together to form first stars, and the galaxy is born out of these these stars. So that's how uh, at uh, at uh, and I explained as to how. Matter and matter asymmetry is broken at some point of time, creating one extra matter part matter particle over antimatter matter particle, which has which is what is seen in the galaxy all around. Of which, of course, we are made up of. So this is a log log plot of.
of uh, the temperature uh, of the universe and the time and as you can see there is a initially there is radiation radiation dominates at high energy all the radiation dominates and then there is a time when the uh, the radiation starts to the matter starts to dominate and then then recombination takes place reionization takes place and there we are now currently wondering about what happened at that particular point of time so um, so for this exemplary explanation which was uh, for this explanation or this op the explanation of the observation made by arnos arnos penzias and wilson um, james peebles has been this is this has been one of his exemplary work in a paper published in 1965 by dicky peebles rolls and dickinson um, he explained as to how the um, universe would have gone on from a radiation dominated time to a matter dominated time and how the radiation temperature would would uh, would would vary and what would be the consequences of it so for this and for other of his uh, other of his subsequent work in the years to come he has been recognized by nobel prize this particular year uh, with the other two gentlemen uh, uh, michel and uh, didier for uh, discovery of the first exoplanet around uh, a sun 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 like star so at that particular point of time though uh, these guys gave the explanation of how what is the uh, what is the cmbr the cmbr was itself discovered by arno penzias and wilson in 1965 using this uh, radio telescope a radio horn 20 ft uh, uh, horn reflector near uh, new jersey in uh, in in united states for which they were given the nobel prize in 1968 some one of the largest radio telescope at this point of time is in uh, is in arecibo in puerto rico in united states which of, of course have uh, have done several important wonderful studies so with that we come to the end uh, of the first part whereby we have uh, said how what is the age of our universe and how matter started to uh, to dominate over the antimatter and we have a, we have a matter universe at this point of a time and not an antimatter universe as the, as would be ex, as would be uh, expected so now let's look at uh, how our solar system forms and what is the general theories about uh, the formation of the 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 solar system so amongst the several there are two major theories about the formation of solar system one is about the close encounter that uh, that our star sun had a close encounter with another star forming more or less at the same time or slightly earlier and it captured some of the planets from that star when when they had a close encounter if all the stars were forming more or less in the in the same from the same molecular cloud or the other theory is that the our sun forms from a planetary nebula nebula would mean a gas cloud from the latin word cloud and then a subsequent collapse leads to formation of all the elements from that 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 cloud so both the theories are uh, have their own uh, consequences uh, the close encounter theory is is not able to explain the angular momentum that we see in the solar system for example how far jupiter is rotating fast and slow the spin of spin uh, the rotational axis as well as the spin of of the planet that we see the rotation of the sun um, which as i said in the last class are the very important physical constraint that has to be satisfied by by any viable theory about the solar system so so close encounter theory although it was proposed initially doesn't uh, address the the basic and therefore the most prominent theory is gravitational collapse of planetary nebula we'll see whether this collapse is a triggered collapse by a sphere by star or it happens gravitationally and assisted on its own uh, we'll come to that in a next next talk yeah so so we'll uh, we'll try to see how gravitational collapse theory of planetary nebula tries to explain the 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 formation of the solar system so what actually happens is a is in a cold dark region uh, Uh, in the cold dark interstellar region the, uh, the the typical temperature is about 10 kelvin and the mass of the matter is about 1 uh, 1 atom per centimeter cube 
so because of the gravitational statistical disequilibrium for some statistical fluctuation matter starts to accrete in some particular region and then then it's a then it's a it's, it's a kind of a runaway process and then it starts to accrete more and more more and more of matter from its surrounding because it has slightly more mass and therefore that particular region becomes the core of a collapse of this molecular cloud so a typical molecular cloud would have a mass of about 1000 1000 times the solar mass over a distance of let's say 10000 astronomical units and then the collapse of this gravitational collapse would lead to formation of a proto sun uh, a sun and then the proto sun would collapse again would go through go through heating and fusion to form star while the rest over material would would heat up condense go around swirl around and would be accreted towards the sun they would form they would get flattened into a planetary disk in which gas and solids would condense condense the solids would go on to make metals and rocks and they would accrete to form terrestrial planets while gas and ice beyond the frost line or beyond the the, the freezing line would go on to capture into a larger body then would form jovian planets the leftover material would either go on to become an asteroids or comet or some of the material formed initially which fails to accrete either into these planetary bodies would be uh, thrown off from dynamical uh, motion of the body then uh, they would be set along some different path which would which would give rise to the comet and asteroid that we currently that we currently see so in a pictorial diagram this is how it would look like uh, 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 interplanetary cloud at a low temperature of about 10 kelvin starts to collapse and then the birth of a star takes place the surrounding material starts to go in a capillarian motion the, the gas is being dragged initially in a capillarian motion then the gas starts to condense form solids and solids rocks and ice and then they get on together to form the planets over a period of time and that's how the solar system currently forms so uh, i have said most of these things large cloud of hydrogen uh, and this is this is this leads to the formation of of the the solar system this is a typical diagram of a of an object called bernard 68 this is about a half light year and about 500 light years from us Uh, it's called cold and dark because it is cold at about 10 kelvin it's called dark because it is not usually visible in a in a visible light but it is composed of a lot of material behind which is stopping the radiation to go from one part to the other so this is a typical uh, uh, figure of a of a cold dark h2 cloud then out of these uh, clouds uh, the dust and cloud one one of them is seen over here in what is called as eagle nebula or m61 the stars are the lights behind but if you look carefully into this particular region the there are several clumps of matter which will form which will form stars over a in the next over the period of time so if you carefully look we can see uh, uh, the the matter is accreting or clumping at different region because of uh, statistical fluctuations and uh, and that's how the onset of star onset of of a gas to the uh, gas gas to formation of a star star takes place now how do we know that they have planetary disk we can observe them now in ir and uh, we have seen that uh, after a period of time once the star is born the we can see the uh, the disks around them which is visible over here in the in these two pictures if you look in ir we can see those two disks exist, existing in the same plane as the as the as the rotating star as the rotating star of that uh, uh, of that of that star so our primordial supernova uh, from which uh, our sun has formed it consisted of the same uh, material more or less 75% hydrogen 25 helium but since we formed a much later some of the material which were synthesized 
previously by other stars where they were thrown into the inter interstellar molecular cloud and some of them were inherited into our solar system now they were incorporated into our, our, our solar system we'll see what importance they have in the following uh, in the lectures and um, from that we can again infer back what what kind of stars were existing prior to our stars in our own close neighborhood um, uh, and therefore uh, they have an implication as to how fast or slow we will collapse leading to uh, leading to several consequences on the way our terrestrial planets evolve so uh, ultimately the structure architecture will also be determined by where we are where the star is collapsing and uh, therefore it is an important constraint to know where we were born so star typically starts out at uh, 10 kelvin it goes on to heat up at 2000 4000 6000 uh, then at the core of the star a million it reaches a temperature of about a million degrees where at each time the nuclei can fuse hydrogen hydrogen can fuse to form helium and therefore radiation uh, therefore the sun is uh, therefore a star is born at that time and then it creates a, a thermal gradient and therefore elements condense out at far off far off distance from the sun and then the whole process continues so the elements condense out depending on where they are and where how far or close they are from the sun uh, uh, because the entire temperature has been heated up beyond 2000 6000 2000 4000 beyond 2000 degrees in the condensation process the the elements that condense out first starts with the most refractive ones so the the elements which would condense first are the ones which have got the highest uh, temperature and then lesser and lesser and lesser and lesser uh, then elements and compounds with lesser and lesser temperature would condense subsequently uh, at far off distance in later point of time So that's how grains uh, first grain forms, and then these grains either through uh, uh, through uh, through impacts on each other or by collisions they they get together and small planetesimals are formed. These planetesimals then go on and strike each other uh, because they are uh, because they are relatively coupled to the gas and they are being uh, because of their size and gravitational pull they are being attracted at a faster and smaller rate. And therefore, uh, they they have a differential velocity, and therefore, because of this differential velocity, there will be larger or smaller collisions. Some of the collisions may may fragment them again, but in several cases, in many possible cases, these collisions lead to uh, lead to accretion of these objects, and uh, accretion of these objects leads to growth of these planetesimals from from smaller bodies that we uh, see in the outer planets and asteroid belts to much larger objects like uh, earth mars and uh, that we see currently so all that happen could happen within a few hundred years to a few million years so the process of uh, building up and uh, deconstruction construction and deconstruction is happening simultaneously which means uh, not necessarily all the times these collisions are uh, are uh, leading to formation of a larger body the collisions could be so strong that it could it could break an entire planet into several smaller fragments so that also is happening simultaneously so beyond uh, so after a particular from a particular dis distance from the sun the temperature is low enough that ice and uh, that starts to condense which suddenly adds a lots of mass around these rocky bodies and a larger much larger planets suddenly grow in mass like the jupiter and uh, jupiter jupiter and saturn and then because of their mass large mass they have a larger gravitational potential well and therefore all the matter which is which is being accreted toward which is being pulled toward the sun will start to feed the growth of these these giant these these planets and they will therefore grow into larger and larger planets forming a, a larger gaseous giants as we currently see them so so for a for a planet like uh, jupiter and saturn 10 to 15 rocky rocky ice mixed mass forms initially and then it because of their uh, because of their mass it it continues it starts to accrete more and more and therefore 
uh, they become much more passive than than the other planets that we see. So typically, J Jupiter and Saturn have 10 to 15 mass uh, rock and ice core, and then they have an hydrogen and helium envelope, which we saw yesterday. Similarly, for the case of Uranus and Neptune, because most of the mass has been accreted, they they have a smaller uh, rock and ice uh, core of about one to two Earth mass, Earth mass, 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 uh, and that's how um, we know that. Uh, that's the current understanding of what we know about the formation of these larger gaseous giants. So the leftover objects, moon and uh, uh, and asteroids. Uh, so the gas is continuing to 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 accrete to these centers of mass. So these are these are the the potential the gravitational potential wells in the uh, in the in the uh, in the plane, and so they will continue to accrete mass. So some of them will go into the star, but some of them, if they are not able to, they will continue to swirl around uh, those planets and those will slowly accrete into forming satellites around them. Just like sun will have its satellites as the planets. These, these planets will have satellites around them, uh, which will again, uh, which will again get together in the same similar, more or less similar fashion. Uh, so, so they will have some of them will have satellites, and uh, the satellites obviously they are not. Yeah, some of these satellites will go away in time, just like uh, this. The, the the disk of Saturn will disappear at, at some point of time because it is either being evaporated or it is being slowly being pulled inwards, uh, and will get accreted towards the sun. Some of the mass between Mars and Jupiter, it it, it just lies on that ice line between the ice line it is being tugged and it has been held together by by the force between mass and jupiter and and the sun and they failed to accrete into a larger and a smaller into the larger body surrounding them and therefore they have been rotating like that for all these 4.56 uh, billion years so, and they and they and now because of some perturbation sometimes they do lose out their equilibrium path and land up on one or the other other planet if they don't, so long as they don't, uh, they exist there in the in the asteroidal belt, and we currently see them, uh, and we currently see them in uh, in the asteroidal belt. Similarly, the icy bodies and comets, some of them could be created over there itself. The rest, some of the very smaller ones, could have been created inside if they were. But then, the dynamical motions of the more massive planets, Jupiter and Saturn, at happened at some point of time and then these matter was scattered uh, into the uh, into the uh, into the uh, outer region by by the gravitational perturbation by the movement of the larger planets around us um, the planets are all some of the satellites are also at their places because of the resonance uh, so for every one particular rotation they are making two four three or and therefore, there are these regions where they are, uh, which are in is in is in resonance, and therefore they are on a stable path. And several of these satellites are actually in some kind of a resonance with the planet itself. So all this process completes by about hundred million years. Then, uh, then the the forming of these uh, takes place within ten to uh, let's say ten to hundred million years, and uh, Afterwards, because of slight, as the gas is dissipated by the star and all, the mass has moved out, so planets have to move in, and therefore, as the planets have to, as the larger planets move in, they they create uh, the gravitational uh, equilibrium path of the smaller objects are disturbed, and therefore they are they are off from their disbalance, and therefore they they fall all over uh, they fall all over the terrestrial planets and. Uh, in the first billion years, there have been heavy bombardment of planets by these rocky and icy objects, which have been perturbed by by the loss of gas from the inner region, and therefore, uh, because as the gas is moving out for conservation of momentum, some material has to move in. So that's how uh, the terrestrial, uh, the rocky planets have a lot of bombardment in the initial first billion year of the formation. So, 
so that uh, so this the entire process of formation is reflected uh, in some or the other way in uh, in the material that we see uh, in different planet and in their compositions in their characteristics in uh, in the way they currently are uh, which which helps us to trace out how these uh, how these um, planets formed as well as the sun sun form so all the the, the their rotation their spin axis their uh, angular momentum and all that is uh, is can be inferred back to that particular time as to what was happening right at the time t equals to zero when when the collapse of the star started. So how do we know that uh, the so some of the recent observations have been made by uh, Alma? It's called Atacama Large uh, uh, Millimeter and Sub Millimeter Array. So it is able to observe in infrared and uh, some of the some of the 20 nearest protoplanetary disk has been recently imaged and uh, uh, they are all these are about to become star all of these are are very young stars and by imaging very close to them we can see that uh, the same process that i descri described just a, just just a while ago that the matter tends to create in a annulus region and then it continues to feed and then all kind of diversity uh, because of this uh, statistical fluctuations happen. So in this, uh, the 20 nearest protoplanetary disks have been imaged. And as you can see, each one of them has an annular region where matter has been accreted into a planet, uh, planet into that particular region. So more observations will show what kind of planets are forming in those particular regions. Some of the recent observations also show that Jupiter tends to fast and stars of those uh, or the planets of those particular types and kinds are being formed so the 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 bar on this uh, figure the small bar on the right hand side of each panel shows about a distance of about 10 astronomical unit while the dot uh, on the left hand side lower panel shows the the size of the star that is expected at that particular uh, for that particular star the name of the star is given uh, uh, on top of the uh, so the classic cases four of four or five of them are shown over here in this the as2 as209 this star is about 1 million uh, 1 million year old and in 1 million year you can see that it has several annular regions right very close to the uh, star all the way outside and these will go on to form form planets around them similarly for another star hd 143006 this is about 5 million years old and it also has a, a protoplanetary disk with a with 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 annular gaps which 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 is depicting that planets are forming in those particular regions the same is the case for another binary system which is as205 uh, the as205 has uh, as you can see in the lower panel that the lower uh, star has, is forming the planets around them which, which is seen as an annular disk in the inner region. So the darker region in all these have been cleared of the mass or of the gas and dust. The IR emissions emissions is hap IR emissions happens from the gas and dust. So the regions which are not emitting IR IR radiations are devoid of the gas and therefore are indirectly evidence of the matter being excreted out of those particular regions. So how do we know our solar system is 4.56 billion years old? So the age of our solar system comes from some of the first datable solids that we have. These datable solids called uh, calcium aluminum rich inclusions. We'll, we'll speak a lot about these in the following uh, talk. These are refractory, uh, these are refractory materials. These are the oxides of calcium, aluminum, magnesium, and iron. Uh, they are they have a very high temperature of formation of about 1700 degree kelvin they are found inside the meteorites and they can be dated uh, because they have a small amount of uranium in them they incorporate small amount of uranium in them so decay of uranium 235 and 238 leading to formation of 204 206 uh, 205 206 and two, okay uh, uh, can be measured and therefore these uh, objects can be absolutely dated 
So these are approximately dated for two LN, for LN the CIs in year 1981 by Chen and Wasserberg, from which they could find that the solar system by 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 the regression of the data they could find that the solar system was 4.5566 giga years plus minus 0 0.008 years. This has been very significantly improved by recent work by Emily et al. Where they have analyzed an, another larger CI from LND, SJ, SJ101. And from that, you can see that the age of our solar system has been inferred to be 4,567.18 million years. The error on this isochrone is 0 0.2 million years. So our solar system, so that's how we know our solar system is, is that old while the galaxy, I, I told you. So as a summary, we have uh, this slide. Um, as I said, um, uh, in the upper panel, we see that uh, that this is a molecular cloud of about 10,000 astronomical units. Because of gravitational uh, fluctuations, some of the regions starts to become poor and then it, then it accretes that, then it starts to accrete more and more mass. One of those cores will start to form a molecular cloud or a nebula around them and a star would be born later on. Obviously, the sizes will start to go down from 10,000 to 1,000 and, and so on. So after a few years, these uh, stars would be born. It would have a planetary system and then um, several billion years down the line, we will have a planetary, several million years down the line, we will have a planetary system. And, and this is the state of our solar system currently now. In this process, uh, at this point, somewhere from starting from here to here to, to somewhere over here, objects of different kinds will be formed. Some of the most refractive ones called, uh, called calcium, called hibonites, which is calcium aluminum oxide, would be forming first because they are most refractory. These hibonites would then continue to interact with the gases around and would form other phases like, uh, like melilite and spinel and corundum spinel, uh, melilite and spinel, they would get together, they would get melted. Some of them would just accrete physically and form what is called as calcium aluminum inclusions because they are made of primary calcium and aluminum and they are found as inclusions within the meteorites, they are called so. At a later point of time, more interaction between the gas and dust would take place and igneous spherical objects called chrondules would form. These solids would go and accrete together to find and melt to find these would accrete together and uh, if they are larger in size then because of the internal heat they would uh, they would melt to form they would melt and differentiate between the silica and iron so if the outer one is is the outer silica is ejected out then we we'll have iron which right if it's a mix between iron and silicate would we'll have something called palisite or or Howard, howardite and diogenides and uh, there will be a mix of all kinds of things and the leftover material would go and accrete into into chondrites and planets and that's how all these things would take place between a few million years starting from somewhere over here to to this uh, to this time so so this is basically all uh, how our solar system forms uh, in 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 nutshell in a, in a gist uh, and uh, for again, for this particular talk also, several useful pictures and diagrams from several research papers, books and websites were taken and I gratefully acknowledge uh, these beautiful pictures and images that were taken uh, from the website and uh, uh, from the website. And I also want to acknowledge um, several of my mentors uh, with whom I worked on some of these areas, uh, uh, which I'll be describing either now or in the subsequent talk and with this i will uh, i will stop at this point of time and uh, i will welcome any comments or questions